the objective in this teaching, praise the Lord, is as believers, we've been set apart. This series is designed to encourage the body of Christ to hold fast to their beliefs and stand firm on the word of God. Say, I am to hold fast to my beliefs and stand firm on God's word. Amen. We are living in some very unprecedented times, some very peculiar times. You know, the world is calling right wrong and wrong right. And we see it all the time. Amen. It's on every television program and every movie we go to, even in the kids' cartoons, there is something that is contrary to the word of God. Amen. You know, there used to be a time when I grew up, there used to be a very clear distinction, a very clear separation between the church and the world. Did it? Amen. Between those who are on the Lord's side and those who aren't. Between those who are people of the way. Anybody know about people of the way? I'm dating myself. The young people are like, what is she talking about? We used to be called people of the way. Amen. Those who were against those who were people of the way and those who were doing their own thing. You know, again, there was this clear distinction between believers and unbelievers. You know, I don't know about you, but but, um, you know, it has nothing to do with the outward adornment. You look at a person, I can't say to them, you're a believer or you're a non-believer. It has to do with how you live your life, how you conduct yourself. Amen. You know, but I'm noticing more and more that the lines of distinction are being erased. You know, more and more carnality is creeping not only into our society, but also into the church. Somebody say amen. Amen. But we as believers who are standing on the word of God, like we talked about earlier, we cannot allow that to continue. We must hold fast to the profession of our faith. Amen. All right. Let's look at first Peter. We're going to go into the word this morning. Amen. It's the word that will change your life. First Peter chapter two, verse nine through 12 out of the amplified says, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a consecrated nation, a special people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies. Listen to that. You are chosen, set aside as a royal priesthood, as a consecrated nation, as a special people for his possession. Why? So that you may proclaim the excellencies, the wonderful deeds and virtues and perfections of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You know, I often hear people talking about what's my purpose. I just read it to you right here in first Peter chapter two, you've been called and set apart and chosen so that you can proclaim the excellencies of the one who called you. Amen. Verse 10 says, once you were not a people at all, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you received mercy. Thank you for your mercy, God. Verse 11 says, Beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers in this world to abstain from the sensual urges, those dishonorable desires that wage war against your soul or against the soul. Verse 12 says, Keep your behavior excellent among the unsaved Gentiles. Conduct yourself honorably with graciousness and integrity so that for whatever reason they may slander you as evildoers, and they will, (laughs) yet by observing your good deeds, they may instead come to glorify God in the day of visitation when he looks upon them with mercy. What I love about this passage of scripture is we've got purpose defined in there. But we also have that last verse that tells us when we are sharing the good news of the gospel with people, we're not drawing them to ourselves, we're drawing them to him. 
And sometimes we kind of get that a little twisted, right? Because people will come to us, as Pastor shared, because they see the glory. We've already established it's not because we're that cute or that fine, amen? It's the glory of God that they see. And we must make sure at all times that we don't mistake what God has given us for us. Let me say that again, that we don't mistake what God has given us for us because it's all about him. Amen. Shout they not like us. Again, you've been called out. You've been set apart. You know, you weren't created for the culture, but you were created for kingdom. But that's where the wrestle comes in sometime. You know, sometimes we think, you know, because scripture tells us, and I'm going to read it a little later, that we're of this world, but we're not in this world. But sometimes we believe that we're going to be here for a lifetime. But that's not true. We are sojourners in this thing. We are passing through. We're not going to stay here forever. And so we've got to understand that we were never created for the culture. We were only created for kingdom. You know, as I was preparing this message, the God gave me this little, I just had this little picture of this little toy. You know, I bought the, this toy for the kids, and I also bought one for my little great nieces. And, and for all of my parents out there, you'll be able to identify with this. It's the little toy that has all the various shapes. Amen. So it's got the little perimeters, and then it has, your, the goal is to take those shapes and put them back into the corresponding little piece. Well, when I was thinking about this message, I was thinking about that's what's happening. It was a little illustration of what's happening with believers. You know, we're trying to, when we're trying to match ourselves in back, mesh ourselves sometimes into the culture when we should be doing it with kingdom, those pieces don't necessarily fit. I, I watch my little nieces struggle. They'll pick up a star and they'll try to put it in a little square. And, and over and over again, they, they're hitting it and they're meshing it and they're getting frustrated because they can't get that star into the square. Where the reality is the star was not created to go into the square. The star piece can, and shape can only go into the shape that it was fitted for. That's the wrestle with believers when we're trying to mesh kingdom with culture. And that's why you're frustrated because as a kingdom citizen, you were never created and designed to fit into the culture. And, and no matter how hard you try, like my little great nieces, it will never fit. I, I say this to you this morning, church. You're not going to fit. And no, no matter how hard you try to force that relationship to work, it's not going to work. And no matter how you try to, look, force that career to come to pass, it's not going to work. The only door that will open in your life are the doors that God allows to be open. I don't care how many times you try to kick the door open or try to move that door open, it's not going to open. And the sooner that you embrace that reality, that you are a kingdom citizen, trust me, life will go a whole lot smoother for you. Amen? Amen. Praise God. Again, as, as believers, we were never created to fit into spaces that God didn't design us for. You've got to remember that the world hates you. Now, now I know hate is a strong word. I don't, I don't, when I was raising my kids, I never allowed them to use two words. One was hate and the other was shut up. To, my kids thought shut up was a bad word. I think it, it is a curse word to us, amen, to the Johnson household. The world hates you. And again, the sooner you realize that, you will stop trying to put yourself in places that God did not design for you to be in. He, the world hates you. I don't, I don't think y'all hear me this morning. The world hates you. When, when people are always celebrating you, talk about the world. When, when they always celebrating you, you better check your salvation. You better check whose side you're on because the world hates you. Let's read why they hate you. Look at John chapter 15, verse 18 through 27. I'm going to read it out of the New Living Translation. Simply because it says, if the world hates you, remember that it hated me first. The world would love you 
as one of its own if you belong to it. But you are no longer part of the world. You got to settle that on this morning. If it's not settled, it needs to be settled. You are no longer part of the world. I chose you to come out of the world. So it hates you. Verse 20 says, do you remember what I told you? A slave is not greater than the master. Since they persecuted me, naturally they're going to persecute you or they will persecute you. And if you had listened to me, look, if they had listened to me, they would listen to you. They will do all this to you because of me. For they have rejected the one who sent me. They would not be guilty if I had not come and spoken to them. But now they have no excuse. See, we are without excuse. We are without excuse. Let me say that again. The uh, judgment starts in the house of the Lord. We are without excuse. Why? Because we just read, he said, if he hadn't come to them, then it would be okay. Because you, you know, he, they, listen, I don't know anything. I have no knowledge in this area. But because he came and he shared and he sat with them and he taught them, guess what? You are without excuse. They were without excuse. Amen. I'm going to go back and read 22 again. They would not be guilty if I had not come in and spoken to them. But now they have no excuse for their sin. Anyone who hates me also hates my father. If I hadn't done such miraculous signs among them that no one else could do, they would not be guilty. But as it is, they have seen everything I did, yet they still hate me and my father. This fulfills what was written in their scriptures. They hated me without calls. You know, you know, life is a trip. People are a trip too. And so having said that, you know, there are people who just hate you just because. Like for no rhyme, no reason, you never did anything to them. They just simply don't like you. That's what was happening in this scripture in Jesus' day. He said, look. I didn't do anything to them. I was only there to be a benefit to them, to help them, to tell them about life after life. Amen. And they stoned me. They cursed me. We know all that happened to him and his disciples. It's the same thing with you. There are times that you've done, you have not done anything to people. They just don't like you. Guess what? Get over it. You got to get over it. They just not going to like you. And it's okay. Verse 26 says, but I, but I will send you the advocate, the spirit of truth. He will come to you from the Father and will testify all about me. And you must also testify about me. Again, this is our responsibility because you have been with me from the beginning of my ministry. Again, here Jesus is speaking with the disciples and he's warning them to expect persecution. I know we don't like that word. Because nobody wants to, to be persecuted. But we as believers know, because we just read, that they don't like you. And they're not going to like you. So expect persecution, amen? And hatred from the world if you follow Jesus faithfully. In a real sense, what Jesus is saying, listen, don't take it personal. They simply hate you because they hate me. That's it. You heard the saying in relationships, sometimes people will say, oh, I, uh, I don't think this is going to work. It's not you, it's me. <laughs> it's not you, it's me. Again, don't take it personal. It's not you, it's me. And this is why, believers, you must stay focused on your kingdom assignment. There is to be no fellowship. Say no fellowship. Come on, say no fellowship between the kingdom of light and the kingdom of darkness. There is to be no fellowship. We are to be completely set apart from the world. There should be a clear line of demarcation. Let me tell you what demarcation is. It's a boundary. Do you realize if you were to look at a map, you'll see boundary lines? And I'm telling you, you can't just leave Virginia, and you can, and drive into to Kentucky and expect to do things in Kentucky like you were doing in Virginia. Kentucky has its own set of rules. Virginia has its own set of rules. The kingdom has its own set of rules. And so you can't expect to do what you were doing in the culture 
and then cross over into kingdom and think you're able to do the same thing. No, there is a clear line or there should be a clear line of demarcation. Amen. Let's look at 1 John 2, 15 through 17. I would just want to put some reminders out there, believer, for you this morning. John 2, I mean, 1 John 2, I'm sorry, 1 John 2, 15 through 17 says, Do not love this world nor the things it offers you. For when you love the world, you do not have the love of the Father in you. That seems kind of harsh, doesn't it? Like, I'm not supposed to love the world. You know, the world is here for our enjoyment. It is, and we are to enjoy the things of the world. But nothing should have our love like the love of the Father and the love of the kingdom. It, it, it's about putting things in priority. Verse 16 says, for the world offers, listen to this, only a craving for physical pleasure. A craving for everything we see. Oh, my God. And pride in our achievements and possessions. Now, so is this saying we're not supposed to have pride? No, we should take pride in the things we do. We should have a level of pride, but our achievements and our things and our possessions should not have us. These are not from the Father, but are from this world. Verse 17 says, and this world is fading away along with everything that people crave. Do you realize when you leave this world, you're going to leave everything that you currently have behind? Do you realize that, that you can't take anything with you into eternity except a soul? Oh, let me say that again. Except a soul. You know, when I was growing up, they would say they never seen a Brinks tr brink truck behind hers. It's the truth. They never, there is no brink truck following hearses. Everything that you have now, your cars, your clothes, your jewelry, your home, uh, and every other possession that you have, all that stuff that's in your, uh, in your junk drawer at home, all of that's going to be left here. For, look, for somebody else to sort out. Can't take anything with you but a soul. And that's why the scripture was saying, don't love this world nor the things it offers you. You must put things in proper perspective. This world is corrupt and it's on its way to destruction. And as believers, listen, we don't adopt worldly principles. You know, Romans tells us that we are to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. And so again, when you're coming from culture and you're entering into kingdom, you've got to wash your mind with the word of God consistently. Because the way you thought was erroneous. The way you conducted yourself was erroneous. And so you've got to take on a new mind. And you've got to take on the mind of Christ. And so we, we do not, as believers, adopt worldly principles. Listen to me. We don't lie to get ahead. No, we don't cheat to get ahead. We don't scheme and scam to get ahead. Oh, come on. We don't use people to get ahead. We don't abuse people to get ahead. We don't hate people. We don't take things that don't belong to us. See, all of those things, that's the culture. That's what the world does. They abuse, they use, they scheme, they lie, they cheat. But that's not us. We are kingdom citizens who operate in kingdom principles. All right, I'm going to say it. We don't buy inspection st stickers. We don't claim dependents that are not ours on our taxes. You would think you wouldn't have to say that, but I believe the Spirit of the Lord is saying, say that. They're just things we don't do. Or things we shouldn't do. Not as kingdom citizens. Not as people of the way. Not as people who walk in the light. We don't borrow the world's strategies and the world's ideas. Instead, we live by kingdom principles. We love in spite of. Oh, let me say that. We love in spite of. We forgive. 
I'm telling you, when we don't want to forgive. When we know you talk about us. When we know. <laughs> Ooh, never mind. Let me keep going. <laughs> we pray. We cover. We protect. And we give. Let me tell you what we do again. We love. We forgive. We pray. We cover. We protect. And we give. See, we have a different mode of operation. We have a different standard that we live by. And the sooner that you come into this realization, the sooner you will do what God has been calling you to do instead of trying to fit into this mold that the world has designed for you. You cannot let this corrupt, godless, worldly culture infiltrate you. You can't do it. You cannot let the culture dictate how you are to live and conduct your life. The world, listen, will try to pit you against one another. They will try to divide you through your socioeconomic class, by your skin color, by your education or your lack of, by political party affiliation, amen. They will try to do anything to get us to focus on everything other than focusing on Christ. And this is why as a, as a believer, you need a revelation of who you are. You need a revelation of who you are in Christ. And once you have that realization and revelation, listen, you'll realize you're the head and not the tail. You'll realize you're above only and never believe beneath. You'll realize you are a conqueror, that you are more than a conqueror, that you are an overcomer, that you are victorious. But you got to get a revelation of who you are and who Christ is to you. You get a revelation, listen, that you don't have to fit into their little clubs. That you don't got to fit into their little secret societies. Looking to find purpose and meaning in everything outside of Christ. Say la. See, you don't need the world's stamp of approval to get validation. Oh, I love this because guess what? You don't need their check mark to be verified. Man, I was reading a story, true story. I was reading an article of a, of a celebrity and she was talking about how she can't get her check mark. She then sent in proof after proof after proof after proof, you know, trying to get them to verify that she is who she says she, she is. And um, she's like, I just cannot get verified. But let me tell you something, believer, those of you who are sitting here today, you already been validated and verified by the blood of Jesus. You don't need to conform to the world standard. To make you feel like you are somebody. Listen, you are somebody in Christ. You are a new creature in Christ. All things are passed away. Behold, all things. Did I say all things? Behold, all things become new. I'm not limiting myself to what the world says about me. That I'm nobody if I don't have a blue check mark. And we strive and toil for things that have no meaning. Remember, you are in this world, but not of this world. The world is trying to get you, listen, to lean into it instead of leaning into Christ. The, the world, y'all see it? All the distractions that they set up. You know, I was talking with Pastor AJ because we were riding back down the road. We were at, a, at our uh, Covenant Siblings 15-year uh, church anniversary. Praise God. And I was so excited for them. And uh, when we were riding down the road and I was telling Pastor, I was like, you know, look at all the things that are set up to distract us. 
You know, when we were growing up, we didn't, social media, the, the World Wide Web, none of those things existed. So it was a lot easier for us to lean into Christ because really the only thing we had to do was hang up the telephone and cut off the TV. That was it. But now with this, with this now generation, amen, they got uh, TikTok, uh, Snapchat, uh, Facebook, Instagram, and all that other stuff that I don't know about that y'all do. And so all of these things are competing, look, for your time, for your talent, and for your resources or your treasure. All of those things are competing for that. And I was sharing with Pastor, I said, it's like the world is in a competition. I mean, the church is in competition. But then I had to change that. I know we're not in competition with nobody. Because, see, what we got to do is we got to preach the unadulterated word, share the truth with people, and then they have a choice to follow Christ or to not follow him. Amen? Again, the world is trying to get you to lean into it instead of leaning into Christ. But as people of God, let me tell you something. We flow with the kingdom. I love the story in Numbers 9 and 17, and I'm not going into it. I want you to go back and read it. But the verse that I love the most, it said, is when the cloud moved, talking about the children of Israel, when the cloud moved, they moved. Oh, I love that. See, whatever God is doing in this season, that's what we're going to do. And whatever God is not doing, that's what we're not going to (laughs) do. When the cloud moved, they moved. And sometimes, you know, I don't know if you know, but I, we ride in the country a lot. And, and I look over and I see, I see a lot of cows, right? And I be thinking about how, they get, how do they get all of the, the cows to move? You know, because Pastor talked about it being one sound uh, with the culture. How do, how do they get all of the cows to move at one time? Well, guess what? They have a sheepdog. And that sheepdog, when he see when he see the cows going a little straight, y'all say sheepdog, the same thing with sheep, same principle. All, all the animals that herd it, that need to be herded. When when they when you see them going off straight, um, get, getting out of line, I would say the sheep they loose the sheepdog, and the sheepdog he get over there and he start barking. Uh, at this hour, we need some sheepdogs, Jesse. We need some people to start barking when they see you getting out of line. <laughs> to believers. I ain't talking to unbelievers. I'm talking about when the believers are getting out of line. When the believers are leaning in more to the culture than the kingdom, we need some people to start barking. Amen? Look, I'm telling you, we got to tune our ear into the kingdom. Again, when I was growing up, they had analog radio. I'm dating myself today. (laughs) And I would, take, I would take my little radio with me to work. And I'd be trying to find a story back then. Well, I try, I, y'all heard me, right? I was going to say a station, but I was looking for them stories back then. <laughs> I want to look, listen to As the World Turns and God Light and all that stuff. Amen. And so the thing about that analog radio was you had to tune it in. But the only way I could really find the station is I had to lean in. And so I would lean into my analog radio and I would begin to flip the dial. And I think I was looking for like 88.1 or something back then. And, and if you go, you know, you're in the weather today. And I, you know how the radio, y'all know what I'm talking about? Right. I had, I, had, I had to listen for a distinct sound so that I could be tuned in. And like Pastor said, and I already said that there was a sound that the culture and the world is listening to, but there should be a sound that we are listening to as believers while we're leaning in and we're fine-tuning what we're hearing. We got to fine-tune what we're hearing. Because a lot of voices are speaking, but is it the voice of the Lord? We got to tune in to his desired frequency because there is a distinct signal that's being released. We got to live by the book, believer. 
Well, what book are you talking about, Pastor Tina? Are you talking about those self-help books? I'm not talking about the self-help books. Are you talking about the seven ways to do that book? I'm not talking about the seven ways to do that. Are you talking about the 10 ways to do that book? I'm not talking about the 10 ways to do anything book. I'm talking about the B-I-B-L-E. See, when I grew up, we would say, that's the book for me. I stand alone on the word of God, the B-I-B-L-E. And see, again, with all of the voices out here, with all that competing for our attention, sometimes we're spending a little bit more time on other books besides the B-I-B-L-E. We offer you reading plans here. Putting a plug, a little shout out. I heard when we say things from, from here, y'all respond. So today I want you to respond. It's the month of August. So we got August reading plans out there for you. After service today, go pick you up one. Because we stand alone on the word of God. Amen? No matter what's happening in the culture, no matter what's happening around you, you must trust God in God. You must lean into him. We can't afford to have your faith fail you in this hour. It cannot happen. Too much is happening in society for you to be thinking, should I be in church? The answer is yes. Should I be on the prayer call? The answer is yes. Should I be there when the doors are open? Yes. There's too much coming at you. Too much happening all at once for you to be second-guessing where you should be. As a believer, again, we move with the cloud. We're living in very critical times. Look at Psalm 20, chapter, verse 7. It says, some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. In the message translation, it reads as follows. See those people polishing their chariots? and those others grooming their horses. But we are making garlands for God, our God. The chariots will rust, those horses pull up lame, and we, I'm lame, and we'll be on our feet standing still. The premise of this, I mean, standing tall, amen, and standing still, glory to God. Too many are distracted in this hour. That's what that's saying. Look, they over there polishing their chariots. And look, in that group over there, they are over there grooming their horses. They're distracted because we as people in this verse, it says we're making garlands for God, our God. They're all caught up in the wrong things. And that's why you got to be tuned in because you could think that you're doing something in the right season and you're not. Or at the right time and you're not. We're spending time on things, again, that are of no significance, of no importance. Listen to me, and I must say this, especially in the times in which we're living, too many people are chasing the bag. I see it. I got to get my bag. Girl, you getting your bag? I got my bag. We're chasing the bag. But are we chasing God? Because sometimes you'll get your bag and you'll forsake God. Oh, let me say it. Oh, you'll get your bag, but you'll forsake God. Not understanding that the scriptures say it is he that gives you the ability to establish wealth. See, when you first came to church, it was, oh, God, oh, God, I need you, 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 oh, God. Almost like... Oh, never mind, I can't chase that rabbit. Almost, I'm, I'm going to say, almost like when I, I was at a concert one time and this guy came up to me and you know how guys do. Uh -huh, and, uh, and he said, oh, where you been all my life? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That's what I was saying about that. That's how we are. We come and we, we get in, you know, in the beginning stages of our love relationship with the Lord. It's like, oh, where you been all my life? But then when we, when we uh, get our bag, we like, peace. Help us, Holy Ghost. You were broken, destitute, need, in need of deliverance. Everything was jacked up. And so you would spend your time in the presence of God 
no matter how long that was. But now that you got your bag and got a little something, some, a few dollars in your bank account, driving the car that you wanted, living in the house that you wanted, now you ain't got time. How much longer that service going to be? Thought he said he was closing. Now he on the third close. Oh, now he on the fourth close. But how quickly we forget that had it not been for the Lord who was on our side, where would we be? See right there? Right there, just that part right there. The truth is, everybody should have been standing. I don't ever want to get so comfortable in my relationship with the Lord that I don't remember where he bought me from. Woe is me. I'm a man undone. And that's what's happening in this church age. We're complacent. We acting like we been where we at. God, I know this ain't proper English. All our little lives. When you know you were a mess. You were, like the scripture would say, a wretch undone. And so we come up in here sashaying anytime we feel like it but there was a time when I was so desperate for the presence of God that the doors of the church could not open fast enough I would be asking around do they got anything going on tonight now we call the prayer meeting and nobody show up why is that? Because that bag is in the way of that relationship with the Lord. Not, not, not just identifying with him. I'm talking about an authentic loving relationship with the one who saved you with the one who delivered you oh my god with the one who gives you life after life I said it on last week and I believe it's so if there is a clarion call to the church in this hour and that's why you got to tune your ear in because if not, you're going to miss the sound. Luke 12 and 20 says this. says, but God said to him, because I'm talking about in this story, the rich fool. Now, pastor don't like when I use the word fool, but the Bible said it. The rich fool. He had stored up all this stuff. And now he felt like he could take his rest. He like, I got my bag. So I'm just going to sit back. I'm going to sit back. <laughs> That's right, don't do it. I'm going to sit back and enjoy all my spoils. But look what the Lord told him. He said, but God said to him, you fool, you will die this very night. Then who will get everything you worked for? And that is a harsh reality, but it is true. We done, lots of you have done all this toiling, and you think you're going to be able to sit back on easy street now and rest on what you built, you fool. Like this guy, many people are not discerning the times that we are living in. Too many are being seduced by this world system. Too many, look, are dependent on this world system. The Lord never told you to depend and rely on the world for anything. Oh, come on. We are kingdom citizens. Therefore, we operate, again, by kingdom principles, such as tithes and offerings. Oh, I'm going to say it. Because I got to help, look, the people that I steward, the people that we shepherd. 
We got to help you in this area, in this area of tithes and offerings. There was a time, look, that we would never spend our tithe money because we knew it was holy and it did not belong to us. But now some of you take the Lord's money on vacation. Oh, you do. Take the Lord's money on, look, to the restaurant. Take the Lord's money to the mall. Look, put the Lord's money on your back and don't think anything of it. What have we become? My God, what have we become? What have we become? You know, as I was thinking about this, oh, I just had this thought, and I was like, oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God. Come here, Mo, I'm going to use you on this demonstration. I was like, you know, somebody need to create a wand. You know, like when you go through the airport, you got to stand in that scanner, and then sometimes when you go to court, oh, praise God, when you go to court, they scan you. So, step on this, on this one step so that way I don't have to come down. You good? Somebody need to create a wand for the body of Christ. You know what it would say? Lord's money. Lord's money. Ding, ding, ding. Lord, Lord's money. Lord's money. It, it seems funny, but it's the truth. A lot of times the Lord's money is everywhere but in the house of the Lord. You may be seated. I can use my daughter in love because I know she's a tither. So she, what she got on, that was part of the 90%. <laughs> now, y'all know I'm being facetious, but there should be some type of conviction. Oh, not condemnation, conviction. There should be some conviction as it pertains to the principles of the kingdom, look, that we are not operating in. And then we're going to get some wisdom on how to operate in them so we can be the benefactor of these things. You know, it, it's just amazing to me. As a pastor, that sometimes people will have the conviction and they still be disobedient. Conviction of the Lord all on them. And they still disobedient. That's a dangerous place to be in. If you cannot hear the conviction of the Holy Spirit, we got a problem. Danger, danger, flashing, danger, 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 danger up ahead. You still going, you still riding. Don't even know there's a drop off point ahead. Danger. You know, when Pastor AJ and I were coming up, my God, okay, I'm just being all transparent for y'all today. When we were coming up in the, in, in the things of God and, and, you know, we would honor the Lord by giving our tithe, right? But there were times that, that we wanted to, to um, sow a seed and, you know, we were looking at our bills. We had, back then, praise God, Lord Jesus, we had a, a lot more month than money, amen? I understand if you're there, we've been there, we get it, trust me. We didn't always, we are not always at this point that we are right now. But we operated in the principles of God, even to the point of sowing seed, because our motto was, if it didn't meet a need, if it wasn't going to meet a need, guess what? It was going to be seed. We're going to plant it, because we look, we're looking for a harvest. That's just the way we grew up. And so we gave our tithes in our offering, amen? And back then, we may have been on Struggle Street. We may have been on Barely Getting Along Boulevard. But one thing we resolved in our own life, and I'm talking about in my own life, I resolved that I was not going to disobey the Word of God. I don't care what I got to do. I'm not, look, I won't pay VEPCO, but I'm going to honor the Lord. Now, you say, but Pastor Tina, that's kind of drastic. I mean, okay. My conviction to the things of God will not allow me to be disobedient to God. And so I'm just going to do what the Lord said. Look, and then I'm going to believe God that the not only I'm going to be able to honor him, but my light's going to still be on. I don't know about you. I just feel like I just need to be a little bit more transparent. I mean, there are times that we didn't have hardly anything. We were po. We, we didn't even have an O-R. We were just po. We were po. P-O. <laughs> and so there were times when we were barely getting along, like I said. But we had enough faith to know that if we keep trusting and keep believing that God was going to give us the wisdom to get out of that situation. Now, it took some time. Because what it took was consistency. 
Sometimes people just don't do things consistent long enough. Just, just quit at the first, well, God did it and God ain't do it. God is not a genie. He is not a musician. He is a principle-driven God. And you got to operate in God's principles long enough to see the manifestation of that thing. We knew we were not going to disobey God's word, so we disciplined ourselves to operate in God's principles. The tithe came off the top. Pastor Tina, why are you still on the tithe? Because that's the area most believers are struggling in. I'm just being honest. Being honest. You got a purpose to honor him, look, above all else. Above all else. And because we operated in those principles, guess what? We not po no more. <laughs> we not broke no more. We not struggling no more. Can I tell y'all something? I just, I didn't even realize this until the other day. I did not realize this until the other day. I was like, my God, I just thank you for the places that you have brought me to and exposed me to. I did not realize, and literally until the other day, Pastor AJ and I was talking, and we realized we are debt-free except for our house. I, it, listen, I didn't say that. I didn't say that for you to give me any type of applause. I said that so you can honor the Lord. Because what he does for one, he would do for others. It wasn't an overnight process. I wish it had been. <laughs> it was a principle-driven process. Because we operating by principles. Look at Deuteronomy 8, 13 through 19. My God, I got to get up out of this. When your flock, when you, when your flocks and herds have become very large, and your silver and gold have multiplied along with everything else, be careful. Do not become proud at that time and forget the Lord your God, who rescued you from the slavery in the land of Egypt. Do not forget that he led you through the great and terrifying wilderness with its poisonous snakes and scorpions where it was so hot and dry. He gave you water from the rock. He fed you with manna in the wilderness, a food unknown to your ancestors. He did this to humble you and test you for your own good. He did all this so you would never say to yourself, I have achieved this wealth with my own strength and energy. Remember the Lord your God. He is the one who gives you power to be successful. In order to fulfill the covenant, he confirmed to your ancestors with an oath. 19 says, look, but I assure you of this. This is a warning. If you ever forget the Lord your God and follow other gods, worshiping and bowing down to them, you will certainly be destroyed. This world and a lot of people in it are fickle, and so they shift with the wind. But that's not us. We are to hold fast to the promises of God. Again, Pastor AJ talked about that sound, that sound, that sound that the world is moving to, but we're not like people of the world. We will not bow to the culture. We're not going to be those who one minute we're walking with God and the next minute we're not. No, that's fickle. We can't afford again to take those chances. There's a possibility that you may not make it back. We've been here 13 years and there's some people who during that 13 year transition decided they didn't want to go after the things of God no more. And I look out and guess what? I don't see them here. Still, there's a chance if you leave, you may not make it back. So if you have made it into the ark, guess what? You need to stay in the ark. That's the place of safety. Don't get caught up. You can't afford to get caught up in the hype of what's happening in society. You can't afford to become anxious about what's the, what is going to happen, what's not going to happen, who's going to be in the White House, who's not going to be in the White House. Look, as long as God is still on the throne, we're going to be all right. We're not like people 
who lose hope. Why? Because we serve the hope giver. Come on. There's an urgency for you to return to your first love. That's what I've been sensing through this entire series. There's an urgency for you to return to your first love. And then you must share the good news of the gospel with as many people as you can. Listen, if it's a dog, I'm going to share it with him. My kids tease me all the time, Mo especially, when she came into our family a few years ago. I said, King is saved. My dog named King. She said, Mama J, yeah, King is saved. As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. King is saved. Again, you can only take a soul with you. And so we're going to share. That's what the we outside is about. We still outside. Just because the series ended doesn't mean it's over. No, we still got a frank mandate. We're still going after our friends, our relatives, our associates, our neighbors, our coworkers, everybody. Amen. We got to warn the world of impending judgment. A lot of people just, just too relaxed in their salvation. They're just, just living, living too loose. Listen to me clearly. This is good for my new partners. <laughs> this is so good. Some of us have been saved too long to be living shady. See, we say we don't have any undercover lovers here at Kingdom Life. We got people who bold, who on fire. And that was the warning again to the church of Laodicea that I was talking about last week. They had grown lukewarm and therefore they were useless. Their selfish focus on just wealth and culture kept them from living on purpose in this life. Jesus is looking for us to get back on our assignment, to get back to the mission. And the mission is, come on, somebody. That's the password. The mission is souls and nothing else. Souls. Young people, souls. Older people, souls. The mission is souls. And it is our responsibility to let them know it's time to repent. Repentance, listen, it's not just words, it's action. Oh, come on, it is action. You say you're not going to do something anymore or any longer, guess what? I'm looking for the corresponding action. It means to turn away. Matthew 3 and 2, in those days, John the Baptist appeared, preaching in the wilderness of Judea along the western side of the Dead Sea and saying, repent, change your inner self, your old way of thinking, regret past sins, live your life in a way that proves repentance. Seek God's purpose for your life, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. As believers, we represent Jesus to the world. How are you representing him? We should be the modern day John the Baptist. We should be the ones crying out, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Amen. The enemy is trying to use the culture to shut your mouth. That's why I said earlier, come on, where, I didn't even use this word energy, but where's the energy for the things of God? We put energy into a lot of things. Where is the energy for the things of God? We can't allow the culture or the enemy to shut our mouths. We are to cry loud and spare not. Proverbs 28 and 1 says, The wicked flee when no one pursues, but the righteous, listen, are as bold as a lion. Where is the roar in the earth from the believers? Where's the roar? My, my brother-in-law over here, he like cats. <laughs> love them. <laughs> Clarify. <laughs> he love cats. Cats, they got a little meow. I don't care if they're kittens or full-grown cats. It's still a I believe, this is no put down, but I believe we got a lot of cats 
in the body. For the scripture just said, we used to be bold as lions. So we got a lot of meowing going on when we should have a lot of roaring going on. In this season, we need to hear the roar. We need that boldness. <laughs> oh, somebody got it up here. <laughs> I didn't catch who it was, but somebody got it. Whatever that was, let's echo that. In this season, from the young to the old, we need to hear the roar instead of the meow. Because what's happening is, well, one thing I know about a cat, <laughs> you back them into a corner, and they begin to rise up on you. <laughs> and somebody going to get hurt. <laughs> Most of the time, it's not the cat. <laughs> it's the same thing about a lion. Lion is the king of the jungle for a reason. If nothing else, it's not about the size of their opponent. It's about the loudness of the roar. I look at the Nature Channel sometimes. Lions don't care who they're going up against. They stick their chest out, they hold their head up, and they begin to open their mouth. You got to be like the lion in this season because too many of us are ducking and hiding when we see the enemy coming. And so we meowing. Meow. when we should be roaring. Because it don't matter the size of the opponent. Because I already know that victory is mine. <laughs> One thing I like about looking at the nature channels, and I'm going to close, is they travel in packs. It don't matter what they're doing. And what the culture is trying to do with us is to get us to isolate when we should be traveling in a pack. It should be, you see one, you see all. You know, some of us got that little motto with our friends. You come after her, then you come, you, go, you fight one, you gonna fight us all. That's how it should be up in here. When we see the head of the enemy rising, it shouldn't be a, you got to fight that by yourself, sister, or you got to fight that by your brother, sister. It should be the whole pack <laughs> coming out to say, oh, okay, you thought, you thought, you thought, oh, you thought. <laughs> I'm looking for my Be More crew to speak up. <laughs> looking for my New York crew to speak up. <laughs> Looking for that Florida crew back there to speak up. Oh, you thought you were dealing with one, but you're going to have to deal with the whole pack. Why? Because when you hear that roar, we ain't got to do nothing in the natural. It's the roar that will cause the enemy to flee. It's the roar. When I look at that stuff, the lion ain't did nothing. Lioness, because most of them doing the hunting. The lioness, I know. The lioness ain't did. She ain't doing too much. It's just the fact that they coming as a pack. They outnumber the enemy or whoever is trying to oppose them. And that's what we should be doing. Hear the roar in the earth coming from the believers. I'm going to close with this. 1 John 2, 9, 18. How to amplify. Children, it's the last hour, the end of this age. And just as you heard that the Antichrist is coming, the one who will oppose Christ and attempt to replace him, even now many Antichrists, false teachers, have appeared, which confirms our belief that it is the last hour. They went out from us, seeming at first to be Christians, but they were not really of us because they were not truly born again and spiritually transformed. See, that's the difference. For if they had been of us, 
they would have remained with us. But they went out teaching false doctrine so that it would be clearly shown that none of them are of us. Children, it's the last hour. Coming to the end of the age. And you've got to keep your eyes and your focus on Jesus. You got to remember why you made the commitment to him. And then you've got to remember and be faithful to the commitment. You can't lose heart in this hour. You can't lose faith in this hour. There are going to be opposition. There are going to be changes. I mean, challenges. We read about it. They're going to hate you. Why? Because they hated him first. There's going to be persecution. They're going to speak all manner of ill and evil against you. But guess what? They're going to hear your roar. We're not going to be defeated in this hour. We're not going to lose hope in this hour. We're not going to let the enemy rob us of our joy. He's not going to rob us of our peace. We're not going to be anxious. We're not going to be fearful. We're not going to walk, walk around in doubt and in unbelief. We're not going to do any of that because that's what the world does and they're not like us. Not only are they not like us, but they don't like us. And if you keep that on the forefront of your mind, you'll be able to walk through this life unscathed and unbothered. Amen. Give the Lord a shout of praise. Come on, give the Lord a shout of praise. They not like us.